Ready? Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Eschman. I'm the national editor of The Forward, and welcome to our second in our series of four Forward Forums. We're here today to talk with Representative Ted Deutsch of the 22nd District in Florida about the Florida vote and what it means for Democrats in Florida, what it means for Democrats nationwide. We're thrilled to have him with us today. Um, just by way of introduction, this is the fourth of uh, this is the second of our forward forums. The next one will be next Tuesday, um, virtually in Los Angeles um, on homelessness. Then in January, we're doing one from Boston on anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on college campuses. We really hope you'll be able to join us for those. Um, briefly, I want to thank Lisa Lepson, Gabby Brooks, Dina Cooperman, and Roberta Kaplan at the forward for putting these all together. Now, um, we have a half hour with our guest today, so I want to get right to him. And then if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A down in the question um, section, and I will try to get to them. Um, so welcome, Representative Deutsch. Um, he's, Thanks. as I said, the congressman from the 22nd District of Florida. This is his sixth term. He's the chairman of the House Ethics Committee and um, a senior member of the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, Representative Deutsch is a native of Bethlehem. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Michigan, University of Michigan Law School. He's married to Jill. They have three children. And he was voted as one of the rising voices in the Democratic Party by Roll Call Magazine. And more importantly, he was voted one of the Jewish politicians to watch by The Forward. So we are watching you um, today. We are thrilled to be watching you. Congressman Deutsch, welcome. And, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. My um, pleasure. Let's get into this. Um, we did a story after the vote in 20, uh, after the 2020 election, we did a story on Florida and the state, uh, the Democratic State Representative Joseph Geller said we did not have a good day in Florida. Trump carried it by 400,000 votes. Um, the polls said it was going to go the other way. Republicans were defeated down the ballots, um, down the ballots, they um, knocked off several liberal Jewish legislative candidates. The GOP increased its control of both houses and they flipped two Miami U.S. House seats. Um, were you surprised by the results? Well, sure, sure. Uh, first of all, Rob, thanks. It's, uh, it's good to be with you. And um, uh, of course, I was, I was surprised because going in, we all, uh, what, what we had were uh, polls, which, as we learned throughout the course of the election, uh, were not um, not to be trusted, and uh, and then we had what we normally have in elections, which is for that feeling on the ground, and it's it's hard when we weren't doing big public events to to really be able to tell, and so we we did lots. I, I was in a lot of events with with. Uh, Vice President Biden and and Senator Harris and President Obama and they were these drive up events and there was as much excitement as you could feel but it was really it was hard and the pandemic hurt I think it hurt the the organizing effort in Florida uh, there's a lot to unpack from this election but um, but we'll be unpacking it uh, during the Biden administration and the best thing I'll just finish this by by pointing out that the best way to to push back against some of the worst kinds of, of lies and attacks during the campaign about socialism and, and the Democratic Party um, is to actually watch the Biden administration as it moves forward in a thoughtful way, uniting the country and creating economic opportunity for everyone. That's, that's going to take care of that whole line of attack going into the next election. You, the polls were off. Were you, uh, why do you think they were off? I, I have I I can only speculate like everyone else. I I don't know, um, uh, but I I think it is. Um, I th I just I think everything was more difficult in the in the middle of a pandemic, and I don't I don't know enough. I won't pretend to know enough about how polling works to know how it was impacted. But I just think that the pandemic made everything more challenging, and I don't know that certain groups were answered pollsters one way, were afraid to give their honest opinions. I don't know about any of that. I know what the results are and I know uh, what we've got to do going forward. But I also know that we're doing it. You know, not only are we doing it in the Biden-Harris administration, but we're doing it uh, even in these early days. We're, we're regrouping 
as as Donald Trump continues to get out there and and try to overturn the outcome of this election, which is showing the real contrast between the candidates, between the president the elect who's trying to unite the country and the current president who um, who is behaving much more like uh, some of those those uh, leaders that uh, the Republicans uh, suggested they should be worried about. Well, I want to get to the um, Hispanic vote a little bit, which is, I think, what yeah. you're alluding to there. I just yeah. wondered, um, just, I'm just curious. I know that candidates have their own internal polling, and then there's the polls that the rest of us get to read. Were your internal polls off as well? And is, have you done anything to kind of change the way you do the polling? Uh, well, I, I think that um, the polling on a district-by-district district basis um, showed how close it was going to be. I don't think anybody really believed that uh, that uh, Vice President Biden, now the president-elect, was going to win handily in Florida the way some of the polls suggested. So I think we knew it was going to be close, um, which it always is in Florida. And um, and in a, in a, a non-pandemic year, in a different set of circumstances, and certainly, as I said, going forward with a, uh, an administration that's going to be bringing the country and, frankly, the state of Florida together, um, and coming out of the pandemic where our our governor has marched in lockstep with the, with the president and in uh, refusing to listen to the scientists and putting forth um, fake science as real science, I, I think that all will carry us forward from here. It, the, the CNN showed a 35% increase in support for the president uh, for President Trump um, from Hispanic voters in Florida. 35%. Did you? Is that surprised to you? Uh, sure, but uh, but during the again during the campaign, Rob, we had we had this this effort to try to to paint uh, Vice President Biden as someone that he clearly is not, and that effort failed most places in the country, which is why uh, why the president elect won overwhelmingly both the popular vote and at the Electoral College. In Florida, particularly among, uh, among some groups down here, especially among, among folks who, who trace their roots to countries that they or their families fled in Latin America, um, where they know the damage that someone like Maduro, Chavez, Castro can do to an economy, uh, <clears throat> the attacks were made suggesting that somehow this is who Joe Biden is. He isn't, uh, and I, I, th I, it seems pretty clear again, as I alluded to before, the behavior that they're worried about um, on the economic side, they don't have anything to worry about. The, the way that some of these, uh, some of the rulers in these other countries behave where they use their attorney general uh, to help them undermine democracy in their countries, that is what we unfortunately have been seeing. and. Uh, going forward, I think that's what we're going to have to deal with. But uh, look, it was a it was a, a strong attack, and um, and I, I I know from talking to my colleagues uh, in Miami who um, who were on the receiving end, especially, it was an effective attack. It was wrong, and they were lies, and people will know that it'll be clear. But for this election, it's going to be too late. It, it was effective. I mean, you said it failed, but the truth is in, in areas where there were a large amount of Latino voters across the country, I'm talking, not just in Florida, Trump actually picked up Latino voters across the board in New Mexico and Arizona, even in Los Angeles. He, I think he, his Latino vote was up by 3%. So um, do, is there a lesson to be learned there about the Republican appeal to this voting group that, that other you know, in other words, you know, are they are they in play, the Latino vote? Well, the um, I mean, the numbers were still uh, still overwhelming with the communities uh, the, still voted overwhelmingly for uh, for Joe Biden. And I, I but but it gets to look, it, it, it gets to a point that I think we all have to acknowledge that you don't take anything for granted. You, you, you can't. You can't go into an election, and the, the Biden campaign didn't do this, but um, but you can't go into an election and assume that because groups have been with you, they're necessarily uh, going to be with you if you don't go out and ask for their ask for their vote. If you don't go out and help them understand why what you're offering to them is going to help help lift them up and lift up their community, that's 
that's the important reminder that, that we take out of here. That, by the way, that's true, not just, not just for specific uh, nationalities, ethnic groups, uh, religions, it's, it's true on a, a socioeconomic level also. We've, we've got to be clear about what it is we're offering about the, the conversations about, uh, about, about populism and, and standing up for the little guy and, and the, the power that, I mean, this is the other piece that, that going forward, it, we've got these, these arguments that were made about uh, the president trying to assert that he was really standing up for, for the little guy when four years, uh, the record is clear that the president was standing up for people just like him. And we, but we've got to make sure that people understand that the policies that we're going to see in the Biden administration are policies that are going to give economic opportunity to everyone, wherever they are, whatever their educational background, um, and and whatever their social beliefs. That 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 our economic vision will work for them. Were you surprised? I mean, in in the Guardian newspaper did a report on how the DeSantis administration, your governor in Florida, actually hid information about the severity of the COVID threat, um, didn't take the right steps, that COVID has actually rampaged through Florida in a way that, yeah. you know, was not clear before the election, actively suppressed by the uh, DeSantis administration. Were you surprised that the Republicans didn't pay a higher price in Florida and indeed around the country for the way they've handled the COVID response? Um, well, I'm not. I'm not, Rob. I'm not sure that I I accept the premise that they didn't. Uh, if you look at, I'll get to Florida in a second. But if you look at at the national results in this election, the primary issue was COVID and and the the awful response from this administration, um, the ongoing efforts by the president to ad advance quackery as some as science and to uh, to play down the severity of this. And the Woodward story, I think, was was really important, all that. So I, I think at the national level, that was the dominant issue. And people were were disgusted by the, the lack of a of a, a real showing of leadership by this president and it resulted in necess unnecessary the unnecessary loss of of many many of lives and so that's the the national level in florida uh, there are we talked about some of the issues at play here but um i didn't see the guardian reporting i want to give a shout out to our our local paper down here the the south florida sun sentinel which which did a, a really strong investigation yeah. and it's it's just it, for those of us who have been in the middle of this, none of it was surprising. I mean, from the very, literally from the very beginning, when Governor DeSantis refused to even give us information about the cruise ships that had come in, which is where the original cases they, uh, they, they said came from, uh, from that very beginning to the way that he handled nursing homes to try to prevent information from getting out about uh, the actual numbers by changing the, the way that testing was done. But one after another after another, uh, there has been this failure in Florida at, at the highest level, and it looks exactly, exactly like what we saw from the president. So we know how this impacted the presidential race, and I think it's too soon to draw conclusions about Florida. I think we'll be in a much better position to see how people really feel about that come the 2022 elections when Governor DeSantis is on the ballot. And then you think he might pay, pay a price for the, the raids on the healthcare officials and, and uh, the other things he's been doing? Well, the, the raids on the healthcare officials, the silencing of, uh, of public health officials before the election, the, uh, the, the refusal to, uh, to allow local governments the ability to, to make their own decisions to keep people safe, the politicization of mask wearing, the refusal to, to do a statewide mask mandate. I mean, there, there is so much that the governor could have done, and now here we are going in the wrong direction again, um, twice after the, after the governor claimed victory. Uh, it just sounds a lot like what the president tried to do and failed at, and I think we're going to see the same thing here, unfortunately. It, that gets to something that's really interesting about Florida, that you have these... Um... Very conservative Republican. I don't know what they are. People like DeSantis who um, and, and Trump winning there. But at the same time that Florida approves um, marijuana legalization, at the same time that it um, votes to let nonviolent ex felons, you know, get retain the right to vote, um, taking steps to reduce gerrymandering. So on the one hand, 
you have these conservative elected officials, and then you have these very liberal propositions that went on Florida. How do you explain that, you know, that kind of Jekyll and Hyde electorate? Well, it's, um, it, it's, not, it's not just one or the other. So the nonviolent um, uh, returning citizens have, that's a great example because the, the people of Florida went out, we amended our constitution because we understood that, that we could no longer be one of the only states in the country that said that, that you will never regain your right to vote once, you've been once you have been convicted of a felony. And we changed that. But, but it's not as if people then looked at the governor and, said, and the president and said, well, we feel that way there, but now we're gonna go in a different direction. That was the decision that people made. And then our legislature and our governor have gone out of their way to make it as difficult as possible to implement that constitutional amendment. Um, they've tried to make it harder for people to vote, make it impossible for returning citizens to be able to, get, to regain their rights. And so that's, that's in part what's contributed to their success. And, and I, I think that's, um, that's the challenge. You gave the other the other examples the the medical marijuana the gerrymandering is another really good one. People get a, in Florida have a sense that uh, that the system as it's run out of Tallahassee doesn't work for them the way that it's supposed to. Uh, and then you look at our legislature. Well, the numbers in the legislature uh, were bolstered even in this last election by the corruption coming out of Tallahassee. The fact that they ran these these fake third party candidates in elections to make it harder for Democrats uh, to win. The fact that, that they went out of their way, as I said, to try to make it harder for people to vote. So there's some of, some of what you see, I guess I, I sum up like this, Rob, some of what you see coming through um, the constitutional amendment process, like raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which we also right, did in this election, one. there's a lag. The people, uh, the people understand what needs to happen. They act. Our elected officials, the conservative elected officials who uh, who are so beholden to, to large corporate interests, they then go out of their way to try to make it po impossible to actually implement the things that the people want. But it all is going to catch up with them eventually, and that's that's the point that I, I think people need to realize. What what matters? The best indicator are the votes on those citizen-driven constitutional amendments. Uh, the elected officials are doing everything they can to try to prevent them from, from being as impactful as they know ultimately they will. So it's this, it feels like there's this pool of kind of progressivism and social consciousness among the electorate. How do the Democrats take advantage of it or, or capitalize on it to actually win the top offices? Right, so I, I know we, everyone's rightly focused on the outcome in the 2020 election um, and for good reason. But in 2018, uh, the Trump wasn't on the ballot. The result was different. The um, Both of the, well, first of all, we elected Nikki Freed uh, as agriculture commissioner statewide, a Democratic woman. Uh, and both our candidate for governor and US Senate uh, barely lost. And I think that's a sign of the direction that we're going. In the next election in 2022, uh, there, won't, there won't be Donald Trump on the ballot, but the governor and Senator Rubio will be on the ballot. And I think the same, uh, the same kind of enthusiasm that you saw in 2018 from, uh, from progressives, from young people, uh, from people of color, uh, this, this broad coalition that really exists in Florida, I, I think you're gonna see that really move and, and take us toward the 2022 election and forward. I want to ask you a little bit about the Jewish vote. Um, I, I, there's a few questions about it, and I, I had my own, but it, I, I had heard a statistic from Jacob Solomon, who runs a federation in Miami, that 30% of their um, of the Jews in Miami now, or 30% of the new enrollees are um, federation members are from South America and Central America. In other words, these are Jews from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I, I assume also from Cuba, places like that, that are you know, that are attracted to Trump's more conservative rhetoric or that bought into this, um, the description of Biden as, as like Maduro or, or Castro. Yeah. Um, 
at the same time, some of the questions are asking whether the squad and the people who are on the left side of the Democratic Party didn't turn off some Jewish voters. I, I mean, do you think these these are also Jewish voters that you know we that, that the Democrats might lose? Well, look, I think that as I said before, you need to to speak to you need you got to speak to all the voters in ways that they uh, they understand and 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 make that connection. Uh, the, look, uh, for all all of the uh, the new Americans uh, who in the Jewish community here in South Florida, uh, I mean the fact the fact is that Debbie Mukherjee Powell and Donna Shalala, um, uh, Debbie Mukherjee Powell herself, an immigrant, uh, they they led the effort uh, to stand up to to Maduro and to make sure that we were addressing the humanitarian crisis uh, in Venezuela. Uh, and uh, and in Colombia as a result, and in other places in the region, uh, but there was this political argument that took hold that somehow uh, somehow Joe Biden is is as you point out, like somehow Joe Biden is is Maduro or is Castro, and and some of my colleagues on the left are pushing him to take those positions, and, uh, and there's there's just nothing further from the truth. We know who Joe Biden is. We're going to see who who Joe Biden is, and in South Florida. Um, for the, the community, uh, when they when, when they hear from the national security team of President Biden, the foreign policy team of President Biden, understand that by re-engaging in the world, uh, we're going to be in a better position to actually uh, have American diplomacy lead the way in standing up to those repressive regimes. I, I think that's how you win those voters over, and I'm confident that's what we'll see. And yet, there, there is a portion of, you know, the, the Republicans have been somewhat successful in painting or at least trying to paint a portion of the Democratic Party as anti Semitic or uh, soft on, or, or anti Zionist. Um, I know you launched a, I think this year you launched a task force, uh, an, an yeah. intergovernmental task force on anti Semitism, internet anti Semitism. Do you think, you know, how do you how do you fight back against the charge that somehow the Democratic Democrats are harboring these, you know, anti-Semitic opinions? Look, I I think it's I think it's okay. I mean, here here's the difference. I think it's I think it's okay and important when there are differences of opinion uh, to acknowledge them. And for the the very small handful of my colleagues, the the couple of my colleagues who, for example, don't support a two-state solution. Um, who who may support BDS and who think that um, that a one state solution is somehow the uh, the answer in the Middle East? Um, their response is not to suggest that somehow that's becoming a dominant uh, position in the party. To the contrary, the response is to point out just how marginal those views are, and the fact that Congress came together to reaffirm its reaffirm its support for a two state solution overwhelmingly to uh, reaffirm its commitment to Israel's security uh, overwhelmingly to condemn the BDS movement with almost 400 votes I mean it's clear where the party is and and we're actually we've been willing to stand up and make that clear in the the past two years that we've held the majority in Washington and then you you contrast that with the incoming Republican class, that includes at least a couple of QAnon supporters. I mean, you talk about anti-Semitism. There, there is no guessing about the origin of QAnon and what it represents, and the and these uh, and these crazy conspiracy theories and the anti-Semitic origins to them. And and yet, these are celebrated new members of the Republican Caucus. Um, there are challenges on the on the left and on the right, um, but but. The Democratic majority uh, in the United States House has been clear in reaffirming its position on on Israel in the Middle East and peace and, and fighting anti-Semitism, and um, and we have real concerns about what we're hearing from the Republican leadership about these new members and this growing influence of uh, of QAnon and conspiracy theories and white supremacy. But you, you know, you chose. We've got to speak out about it. The, the point, Rob, is. We've I make I make this point all the time. Fighting anti-Semitism isn't partisan, uh, and frankly, the U.S. Israel relationship 
uh, has never been partisan. And it's in all of our best interest to, to work hard to ensure that that continues to be the case. How are you going to deal with a, a colleague like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's actually a QAnon supporter? Are you going to approach her? What are you going to do? I am. That's a really good question. And I, as someone who, uh, who tries to find some common ground, um, tries to find some common ground with my, with my colleagues, um, it, it is, um, it's hard to know how, it's just hard to know how I interact with someone who, who is a conspiracy theorist. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess uh, maybe I'll have lunch. Who knows? <laughs> um, uh, uh, what, what do you think the best path forward is? Uh, you know, we used to think of Florida as a swing state. Do you think it's still a swing state? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, as I said, you, if you look at the 2018 election, um, I think that's a good indication. If you look at what happened, again, the minimum wage vote that we had this time, uh, yes, the presidential numbers didn't turn out the way that we wanted, and we lost a couple of good House members. I have every reason to believe that that there will be competitive House districts in two years, and that we're um, uh, and with the statewide offices, governor and senator, that we're going to have really competitive races there as well. You also have a new resident in Florida, um, Donald Trump. Is, is he's not going to be in your district? Is he? Is Donald Trump? A... Mar-a-Lago is is not in my district now. Um, do you think he's going to have an impact on Florida politics? The fact that he's living there now? Uh, well, listen, he is, yes, Donald Trump's going to have an impact on Florida politics because uh, as long as he's around, um, he has no greater cheerleader than Ron DeSantis and our governor. And given the speculation that, that Governor DeSantis, Senator Rubio, and Senator Scott all want to run for president uh, in four years if Donald Trump is not running again, I suspect that just the shadow of Donald Trump is going to hang over the three of them, and they'll continue to act in ways that that seem to serve his interests more than they serve the interests of the people of Florida. That's going to be a challenge for all three of them. Would he have won without the COVID pandemic across the country, do you think? Uh, would Joe Biden have won? No. Would Trump, sure. would, would Trump have oh, been oh, elected? Oh, oh. oh, I understand. Um, no, I don't. I, I don't think so. Look, it, the pandemic highlighted all of the failings of leadership of the current president, and and it all came together in in one place. And the way that that he puts himself ahead of the interests of of everything and everyone else. The the fact that he didn't believe, doesn't believe in science, doesn't believe in institutions, doesn't believe in international diplomacy, uh, doesn't believe in American leadership abroad. All of that was was brought together um, in a, a a really awful looking little package um, called COVID nineteen and the coronavirus. Um, but even without that, everything else was still there. All of those things that I just laid out were still there, and I have I have great confidence that that the American people would have recognized that as well. So I just have a couple more questions, but you're advising Joe Biden, let's say, uh, on what he can do that will ensure that next time the Democrats win Florida, what's the most important thing a Biden administration can do um, to, to regain Florida for the presidency? Uh, well, the, uh, uh, President Biden uh, can and will work hard, one, to, uh, to ensure that we can try to get back to as close to normal as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, to stand up for small businesses and working families and make sure that they weather this storm and then have the opportunity uh, to succeed, to provide opportunity for entrepreneurs and all the people who move to Florida because they, they see it as a place where they can, um, they can try something out, they can build their own business, whether they're coming from another country or they're coming from another part of uh, uh, of America, uh, and uh, and to, to uh, and to make sure that uh, that he does all of this by by showing his commitment to bringing people together. That will be such a dramatic change um, that uh, that if he carries through on that, as I'm confident he will for the next four years, um, then what we've seen that the division, the the 
attempts to pit one group against another, the attempts to undermine people's faith in democracy, which has been the hallmark of this administration, will be a, a distant memory. People will will be clamoring for continuation of, of what Joe Biden is about to deliver for us. You talked about 2022 as being kind of the defining moment when people will really you know, make their choices about the current leadership in Florida. Um, so I need to ask you, are you running for Senate in 2022? No, I, 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 am, uh, I am at the risk of sounding like every other politician. I, I'm, my, my sole focus right now is making sure that I continue to do the best I can representing my constituents and helping the Biden uh, administration be as successful as possible because that's the, going to be the key to success for our country. It's also going to be the key to success in Florida in 2022. So is that a yes or no? I, I couldn't quite tell. I, no, am I announcing that I'm running for Senate? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, look, we're, we just ran up against our time, but I really want to thank you for joining us. Um, and I want to thank our, our, our listeners uh, for joining us. And um, we look forward to hearing more from you, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure. This was fun. I'll talk to you soon, Rob. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.